verses 19 through 31. We'll be reading in a few moments. Some of you have asked about Stephanie. Our elder daughter is 22 years old now. She just graduated from Southeastern University. She works for the university. She was in Chicago this past weekend. I don't know whether she's still there or not. And uh, she travels a lot representing the university as an admissions counselor. And she'll be starting on her master's program, God willing, in January. And the best part I like about it is it's paid for already So, by Southeastern. So I'm, I'm grateful for that and by her work. And so we're, we're thankful for that. I want to share with you this morning about the mandate of the church. What if there were dozens of people caught in the top floors of a tall burning building? A fireman was there and he knew the way to safety, but he didn't help anyone. All those people died needlessly. Do you think that fireman deserves to be punished? Of course, we know a fireman would never do that, but what if there were a terrible storm and way up on the mountain over a deep gorge there had been a bridge but the storm had been had destroyed the bridge and it was late in the evening completely dark and a police commander sent one of his officers up there to uh, to guard that area and to warn the people and the, the, the officer just went and parked on the side of the road and just sat there and didn't warn anybody he watched family after family drive right by him he didn't stop them he didn't warn any of those people and they all plunged to their death if you were to read a news article like that, how would you feel about that police officer? Again, we know that a police officer would never do that. But imagine if you were sick and didn't seem to be getting any better and you were prayed for and you went to the doctor and what if after running several tests he discovered you had cancer but he didn't want you to worry or feel bad so he told you you were okay. And you kept getting sicker and sicker and finally you went to see a Another doctor, and he did some tests, and he told me that he could have performed a simple operation and that you would be okay, but, but he didn't see you, and now the cancer is spread throughout your body, and there's nothing that the doctors can do. How would you feel about that doctor? In Luke chapter 16, we read, beginning with verse 19, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died, and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In hell, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Father, we pray that you would add your blessing to the reading of this word. Open our hearts. Help me to say everything I should say and nothing additional. Help us, each one of us, to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit as he speaks to us this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. From this story, Jesus told... I would like to point out four key phrases about hell. The first one is in verse 23. In hell where he was in torment. Someone say torment. Verse 24, because I am in agony in this fire. Verse 25, you are in agony. Abraham agreed with him. Verse 28, warn them so that they will not also come to this place of Torment. So we see the word agony twice and the word torment twice and we see the word fire. 
I was in a seminary class a couple of years ago, and we were reading, had been reading books about a certain part of theology, and we had read a book about eternity, and in that book, uh, the author talks about how hell is really just a figure of speech. It's not really... There are not really flames in hell. There's not really a fire. And that now that we have evolved as human beings, we understand that. We've become more intelligent that we don't, we know that Jesus was just speaking figuratively. I was sitting in class and the professor was talking about this and no one was speaking up, so I dared to speak up. professor seemed to agree with what the author of the book was saying, and I took him to task on that. I suffered in a final grade, but that's all right. The truth went out. I'm foolish enough to believe what Jesus said. I don't think I'm smarter than he is. If Jesus said there, were flame, there are flames in hell and there's torment in hell, then there must be flames and torment in hell. It's not a figure of speech. Professing themselves to be wise, the scripture says, they become like fools. Frequently, the Bible warns us about the reality of hell. Every day, someone has said that approximately 100,000 people die without Jesus Christ. So every 60 seconds that we breathe, 70 people take their last breath. In his preaching, Jesus said more about hell than he did about heaven. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the scripture says, The Lord is patient because he doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Anyone who goes to hell goes against the will of a loving God. Believe me, I argued with God for quite a while over the last week, trying to preach a different message, something that's encouraging, inspiring but the Holy Spirit kept bringing me back to this. I want to share with you a poem called Hell, the Prison House of Despair. Hell, the Prison House of Despair, and I don't know who wrote it. I could not find an author. Hell, the Prison House of Despair, here are some things that won't be there. No flowers will bloom on the banks of hell, no beauties of nature we know so well. No comforts of home, music, or song, no friendship or song, will be found in that, no friendship or joy will be found in that throng. No children to brighten the long weary night, no love, no peace, nor one ray of light. No blood washed soul with face beaming bright, no loving smile in that region of night. No mercy or pity, no pardon nor grace. No water, oh God, what a horrible place. The pains of the loss no human can tell, not one moment's ease, there's no rest in hell. Hell, the prison house of despair, here are some things that will be there. Fire and brimstone will be there, we know, for God in His Word has told us so. Memory, remorse, suffering and pain, weeping and wailing, but all in vain. Blasphemers, swearers, haters of God, Christ rejectors while here on earth trod, Murderers, gamblers, drunkards, and liars will all have their place in the lake of fire. The filthy, the vile, the cruel, and mean, what a horrible mob in hell will be seen. Yes, more than humans on earth can tell are the torments and woes of an eternal hell. There are three votes that determine our eternal destiny. The first one is God's vote. God the Father cast his vote by sending his son. We sang about his son, Jesus Christ. Oh, what a savior. Oh, what a savior we sang while ago. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. I want to caution you, please don't. I know sometimes we've heard a scripture so often that we stop hearing it. As soon as it starts to be quoted or read, we tune out. But I want to 
challenge you again. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Oh, what a Savior! The second vote was from Satan, of course. Satan's vote in 1 Peter 5, 8, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And then John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So we know what Satan's purpose is. We know what his task is. We know what his business is. And unfortunately, it seems that sometimes he is more serious about his business than we are about ours. Sometimes it seems that Satan may believe the word more than we do. That Jesus is coming soon. The scripture says he is furious because he knows that his time is short. Do we realize how short our time is? And then of course there's your vote. The power of a person's right to choose has never been taken away. You know, here in America, we have made choice into a God. When we can slaughter babies by the hundreds of thousands every year because of choice, then we have made choice a God. By the way, I know where the Supreme Court is, and it's not in Washington, D.C. It's in the throne room of heaven. And one day... Those who think they are judges will answer to the real judge. You make your own choices every day you live. Moses reviewed God's laws before the Israelites, then said, I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose. Somebody say choose. Now choose life so that you and your children may live. I want my children to live. Don't you want your children to live? And your grandchildren, I want America to live. I want us to walk again under God's blessing. I want us to experience His favor. And it's not going to happen by voting for a particular party, even though voting is important and we should be informed. And we should, But our salvation comes from one person alone, Jesus Christ. And it may look like the Republicans are in control or the Democrats are in control or the Independents, but God is in control. Grateful for that news. Joshua instructed the people before his death, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. The one point that sometimes we may miss is this. We will all serve someone. We will all serve someone. The question is not whether you will have a God. Even the atheist has a God. The God of the atheist is in the mirror. He worships himself. He or she thinks that there is no God or they say there is no God. One day they will give an account to the God they have spent their life denying. So we pray that they will continue to experience God's mercy until conviction draws them to Christ. Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. The fact is we're going to serve somebody. We need to make our choice. In Mark chapter 10 verse 22, Jesus offered the rich man a choice and he made the wrong choice. Remember, he came to Jesus and he said, What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus told him and he said, I've done all these since I was a child. And and he said, One thing you lack. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Now, Jesus wasn't saying there that it's a sin to have anything. He was merely saying that if anything comes between us and him, then it has ceased to become us having that, but it becomes that having us. And that's when it's wrong. In John chapter 6, verse 68, the disciples made the right choice. Jesus asked them, will you also leave me and Peter for a change, to open his mouth and said something good. Have you ever felt like Peter? Sometimes I do. I open my mouth and wrong thing comes out. Peter opened his mouth and said something good. He said, 
Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We all have the right to make whatever choices we want. Yes, we do. You say, well, I can make my own choice. That's true. You're right. You can make your own choice. But the consequences of your choices are already determined by the eternal, unchanging Word of God. So you may choose whatever you like, but you may not change the consequences of your choices. And that's what we must understand. We all make appointments for various things. Many of our appointments are things that we do on a regular basis. For example, there are certain times that we must be at work or at school. There are those who help to lead worship and they have an appointment to meet, to practice together as a group. We make dental appointments and doctor appointments and hair appointments and appointments to get a, our car repaired. One appointment I have is not on my calendar, but I will keep that appointment. I have no idea when that appointment is, but I know that I will not be late for that appointment. And some of you are way ahead of me, and some of you are thinking, why? How can you have an appointment that you don't know when it is, and how can you keep that appointment? Well, the appointment we're talking about, obviously, is death. I don't know when I will die. could be today, or it may not be for many years. But I know this, unless Jesus comes back first, I will die. Death is a fact of life. Say, I was discouraged when I came in. You're not helping any, John. <laughs> the death of the righteous is sweet, the Scripture says. It's not, it's not a terrible end. It's a wonderful promotion. I love what D.L. Moody said one time. I, I'm sure I'm not going to get this quote exactly right, but... He said, one of these days you're going to hear somebody say that D.L. Moody is dead. He said, don't believe him. It'll ne it won't be true. He said, uh, he said, I'll never be more alive than I am now. He said, I, he said, I'll never be more alive then. At that time, I'll be more alive than I ever have been. I'll be more alive at that time than I've ever been. So, what a, it's a, it, the quote's better than I just did it. I messed it up. Sorry about that. I'll never be more alive than I at that point. God sets the date and time of the appointment. He's the only one who knows when the appointment is. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this to face the judgment. That's the reason I said one time before, I hate Buddhism. Somebody said, that's not a tolerant thing to say, John. Oh, no, you don't understand. I hate Buddhism because I love Buddhists. I hate Buddhism because it is a lie hatched in hell that tells people that reincarnation exists, that when you die, you are reincarnated again and again and again. But the Scripture said it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that to face a judgment. I hate Buddhism because Buddhism has damned many of my Chinese and Cambodian friends to an eternal hell. I hate anything that stands between people and God. Whether it's the Islamic faith or the Buddhist faith or the Hindu faith or Taoism or Shintoism, anything that runs counter to this Bible is wrong. And it will keep people out of heaven. I'm tired about hearing about tolerance. Show me one place in the scripture where Jesus said we should be tolerant. doesn't say tolerance. You shall know the tolerance and the tolerance shall set you free. We are not taught to be tolerant. We're taught to be truthful. And the most loving thing you can do is not to tolerate something that somebody, the most, to, the most loving thing you can do is to tell them the truth. Hear me, folks, it's not the church's business to make people more comfortable on their way to hell. If you go to hell first class, you're still going to end up in the same place. You may travel better, but you're still in the same destination. God, help us. Help us to love people enough to tell the truth. I would rather someone get temporarily offended with me because I loved them enough to tell them the truth 
than to be quiet because I didn't want to offend them, but then they spend forever in hell. You tell me, which is more loving? You don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out. It's appointed unto man once to die. In the story we read in Luke 16, both Lazarus and the rich man had an appointment with death. Neither one of them knew when death would come, but both of them kept that appointment. Now let's look at what happened to these two men. Lazarus was very poor and very hungry. He had a disease and was covered in sores. Maybe his leprosy, we don't know. Even the dogs felt sorry for him because they came and licked his sores. Lazarus was so hungry that he ate the food scraps the rich man threw out with his garbage. I've seen, seen children in Cambodia digging through garbage. It's a shocking thing to see. Can I just say it's, we, we, for the most part, we don't know what poverty in America is. I'm not trying to say there's not people who, don't, who have needs. I know there are. But Lazarus, even though he was very poor, he must have had a clean heart. He had a faith in God because when he died, the angels came and carried him away. Now that's traveling first class. The angels came and carried him away to paradise. The rich man was very, very rich. He dressed in the most expensive clothes and lived in luxury every day. The rich man looked great on the outside, but his heart was not clean. When he died, the angels did not come to carry him to paradise. Look at the first two words of verse 23 in the New International Version, at least. The first two words of verse 23, say it with me. In hell. In hell. The only things that we know about hell are what God tells us. The following scriptures describe what hell is like, and I'm just reading a few, obviously. Matthew 8, verse 12 there is darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, 41. Then he, say, he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell was never prepared for humanity. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. John three thirty six. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. For God's wrath remains on him. Romans 2, 5, But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 through 9, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. Talking about punishment. There's a certain man that attends this church. My father. He believed very much in the principle of discipline in Scripture. And my punishment usually took place in their bedroom. When we first became missionaries and started itinerating, uh, Dad and Mom were away for uh, that weekend and that we were in this area. and So they said that we could stay at their home. And that evening we were preparing, getting their children ready for bed. And Joyce said, your parents said we could sleep in their bedroom. You want to go in there? I said, I'm not going in there. <laughs> she said, what's wrong? I said, that's where I got all my whippings at. I'd have nightmares if I went in there, if I could ever get to sleep. <laughs> Punishment. Punishment never feels good to us. Eternal punishment, unfortunately, will never end. Revelation 21, verse 8, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars... Their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. I've heard people say, and I'm sure you have probably too, I don't want to go to church. There are too many hypocrites there. Then I, I told, I've told more than a few people, then you certainly don't want to go to hell. Because that's where all the hypocrites will be. 
Amen? Look at Revelation. I'm going to turn over in my Bible to Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, earth and sky, fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. When you die, if your name is not written in the book of life, you will go to hell. That's not a tolerant thing to say. It's a truthful thing to say. It's a loving thing to say. And even though I don't know most of you, God, by His grace, allows His love to flow through us to each other. And I love you. And I don't want to see anybody in hell. Anybody to go to hell. There's only one way to get your name into the book of life. You must admit you are a sinner. You must ask God's forgiveness after you repent of your sins. You must believe Jesus died as a sacrifice for your sins and that God raised Him from the dead. You must become a child of God by receiving Christ and confess that Jesus is your Lord. Then you can make heaven your home. That's the reason we go. Because we want heaven to be crowded. And we want to do everything within our power to make hell sparse. And heaven crowded. I want to give you an urgent warning this morning. I know, I understand this is a solemn message. The, the truth that we're trying to convey this morning is not something that will get us excited and make us jump and cheer, but... We all have family members, a, a husband, a wife, a son, a daughter, a mom or a dad or a niece or a nephew or a cousin. We have neighbors, we have family members and friends, we have colleagues at work that don't know Jesus Christ and we must speak up. Your job, wherever God placed you, is just as important as anybody else's job. Because if you're doing God's will for your life, that's what matters. It's not about your location. It's not about whether you're in Micronesia or, or Michigan or Greenville, South Carolina. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter as long as you're right where God placed you. If you are where God placed you and you do His will, then you will reach out to those around you because all of us, we are either missionaries or mission field. I have an urgent warning for you this morning. The building is on fire and you will choke to death if you do not take the way of escape. Hell is real. The bridge is out. You and your family will plunge to your deaths if you refuse to change direction. The tests have come back. You have spiritual cancer. There is only one cure. There are not many ways to get to heaven. There is only one way. You will die if you wait too long. Jesus asked this question in Mark 8, 36. What good is it for a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? I beg you young people, live for something besides money and fame and power. One day when we stand before God, the only thing that's going to matter is your relationship with Him and His Son, Jesus Christ. It's not going to matter about how fancy your car is or how many people follow you on Twitter or how many people know your name only one thing is going to matter is your name in the Lamb's book of life live for something bigger than today and tomorrow live for eternity make your life count 
You say, you're getting a little bit carried away, John. Well, you know, I've seen 110,000 people in a football stadium going crazy over a little leather ball in the middle. I love college football, especially when my Carolina Gamecocks win. And that's getting to be less and less frequent. My daughter says, Daddy, one day you'll wake up and start pulling for Clemson. But one thing I'm happy about is this. I don't ever know what's going to happen with Carolina, but I know this. I'm on the winning team because I'm a part of the family of God. And I know that in the end, we will win. And the, the world makes it look like we are losing. The world makes it look like there's only a few of us who care and love God. But I have good news for you this morning. There are hundreds of millions of Christians all around the world who love God. And they worship the same God you do. And they will give their life for Him. Hallelujah. Three votes determine where you will spend eternity. God has put in His vote for you to go to heaven. Satan has cast His vote for you to spend eternity in hell. But you have a choice. You cast a deciding vote. You determine the outcome of this election. And this is the most important vote you will ever make. There's nothing more important than your eternal soul. The distance to heaven or hell is the same, just one heartbeat away. Look again at Luke 16, verse 22. Luke 16, verse 22 says, The time came. Somebody say that with me. The time came. The time came for Lazarus. The time came for the rich man. The time will come for me, and the time will come for you. I have one final question. Are you ready? Are you ready? Father, take something that we have stumbled to say this morning and drive it home to our hearts. Change us by your Holy Spirit. Oh God, soften our hearts. If we've been turning away and saying later, we'll do it later, maybe next Sunday. God, call something to break in my heart this morning. Call something to break in our hearts and cause us, Lord, to run to you, God, to run to this altar and throw ourselves on your mercy. Lord, we confess we can do nothing good without your help. Every time we touch something, we will mess it up unless we have your help, God. So we ask your help even in this thing. Help us to be honest with ourselves. It doesn't matter. I want to challenge you this morning. It doesn't matter who is around you. It doesn't matter what anybody else is going to think. It doesn't matter what your position in this church is. The only thing that matters is your position with God. Is your heart right with God? I know that's very confrontive. It's very straightforward. The truth you shall know the truth. The truth shall set you free. Oh God, touch hearts. I want you to know that if you, if, if you want to talk to somebody, if you want to pray with somebody, I would be honored. And I'm going to be standing up here at the front. I'd be honored to pray with you. I won't make a scene. I won't start yelling or screaming. I'll just, just you and me and God, we can, we can talk together and we can pray. God gives us a precious promise in His Word. He who comes to me, I will never turn away. Somebody say never. I will never turn away. Father, we thank You for that promise and thank You for these musicians who are here to help provide background music.